that forms the next part of the tutorial series which is focusing on Japan from 1904 to 1937. What we're going to be focusing on in today's tutorial is the next period of Japanese history. Um, and into the 1930s, what we really want to focus on is the rise of militarism. And this is really triggered first and foremost by the events of the later 1920s, most importantly, the Great Depression. And what we're going to see in the beginning of the 1930s is the collapse of party politics from 1930, okay, and then finally the end of the party cabinets in 1932. The images below give you a sense of the period. We go from um, looking at you know children who are you know scrounging around for meals due to the Great Depression. We then see a real kind of socialist movement and labor movement um, being um, spurred by the Great Depression. The next photo case you see is the Saito cabinet. This is the first of the party cabinets, which is not controlled by a parliamentary party. So we have the end of the kind of parliamentary democracy, which had been so fragile during the Taisho government, and then ultimately leading to the rise of militarism, as you can see represented in that last image there. So if you haven't yet watched the tutorial videos on the Taisho period, and looking at the challenges to traditional power and authority during that time, and the pressures posed by uh, groups such as the Zaibatsu, the Constitution, political parties, and other bureaucratic elites, then you should definitely go back and have a look at those videos before continuing on this with this tutorial. The key focus question of this period is how did militarism develop? Um, and you know, this is really now, after 1932 and after the collapse of party politics, this is now really considered the, you know, the start of the Showa period. Yes, the Showa period does start in 1926 when Emperor Hirohito becomes the emperor. He's then crowned in 1928, but we still have the parliamentary democracy of the Taisho existing until 1932. So just remember that when we talk about the Taisho democracy, we're talking about the period from 1904, you know, the Russo-Japanese War, all the way through to 1932. However, the Taisho period is only from 1912 to 1926 until his death. Um, and so this is a real kind of focus. Remember that, you know, we had looked at early in the 1920s that they promised this kind of show of restoration. This is it now really coming to the fore. Um, some of the sub questions we're going to delve into in today's tutorial is what was the impact of the Great Depression on Japan? And then how did the party politics collapse in 1932? Just to give us a sense of you know, the period, I have this great quote from historian Richard Story, okay, which he says, the dominant theme of the 30s in Japan is the ever-increasing assertiveness and power of the army. This real kind of rise of militarism, which is really going to be at the forefront of what is happening during the period. So, how do we get there? So, we go from democracy to disaster. Between 1929 and 1932, Japan struck by a series of shocks, economic, um, social conflict, military expansion, political assassinations, and so these culminate in really transforming the nation. Um, and so by the time we get to 1932, the nation is very, very different to the one that had occurred prior to the 1929. Uh, the depression fueled by internal deflationary policies, we're going to look at that, what that means in a moment, um, an external collapse of the export market caused by the Wall Street cash of October of 1929. And most importantly, historians have really um, reflected on this. And, and previously, the, the view has been that it necessarily wasn't as bad for Japan, um, but that it really had this moment of crisis. That is now being kind of reassessed, and, and the impact on Japan shouldn't be kind of understated. Um, they were very reliant on, you know, large export market and so when the world you know economy collapses japan is really struck by this um and you can see the key the quote from gordon you know which talks about you know by the end of the 1930s and what we're looking you know towards by the end of this period and we have the you know the end of independent political parties business association production cooperatives labor unions and tenant unions were replaced by a series of state-controlled mass bodies intended to mobilize the nation 
for its holy war with China and bring harmony and order at home. So what we have is a shift from, you know, a democratic style government to the move towards authoritarian control. So pre-Great Depression, okay, the prime minister who at the time is uh, Hamaguchi had come to power and promised to revise a kind of stagnant economy that had been you no know, prevalent during the 1920s. Remember, we looked at the economic situation in the 1920s. We've got the Great Kanto Earthquake. We then have the Showa financial crisis in 1927. Um, and so what he had tried to do is really decrease inflation uh, by boosting exports and lowering government spending and also having a very much a tighter control on um, money and then also returning to a fixed exchange rate using the gold standard to stabilize international trade and investment. So what the gold standard does is it guarantees the value of the currency um, in its weight equivalent in, in gold. So when we have the collapse of the stock market in 1929, this leads to a huge range of impacts and it's really um, intensified by the policies, the economic policies that Japan had you know, implemented prior to the Great Depression. So the reforms that Prime Minister Hamaguchi had pursued had definitely been effective in reducing prices. Um, but the J Japan returned to the gold standards, prices were plunging. So this leads to really, really deep deflation. So at the moment you would have maybe heard about inflation rising prices when we have deflation this is the opposite we see massive reducing of general price level and so this you know really erases the benefits of lower prices you might think low prices are really good for everyone but if that happens wages get cut tremendously as well so deflation is actually somewhat more problematic than inflation um, and so you can see here that the price of agricultural commodities such as rice and barley, real staples to the Japanese diet, fell by 43%. And so you can imagine that 50% of farmers' earnings, farmers' revenue is cut. What impact does that have on the agricultural industry in Japan? Um, so in 1934, it's then intensified further. Rural communities were hit by famine, okay, especially in northeastern uh, northeastern provinces um, and then they were also hit by a tsunami as well um, so what this leads to is general undernourishment you can see that in the image um, some farmers were also forced to sell their daughters for prostitution um, and so this rural disaster really causes a huge amount of anger and as i spoke about in the previous um, tutorial the idea that the army is really drawing from this peasant community really drawing from the rural community and so you can see that you know the seeds of this anger and and, and frustration with the government is really being driven by the the peasant you know groups um you can see here is a poster from uh, march of 1933 um, in which they call for extend the workers hands to the starving farmers by immediately donating monies and supplies um, and so you can see here, this is the fusion of these new kind of ideas of communism and socialism as well. So we see, you know, the idea that they're, you know, referring to the peasants as, you know, the proletariat. So using that kind of um, communist language as well, which is also going to have a pressure on the government. So moving on from that, okay, the huge increase in income leads to an inability to pay rent. And as we know in Japan, Japan at this time still has a tenant farming arrangement in which the people who own the land are not necessarily those who are farming on it. That is then leased to farmers, um, which is called a, a tenant farming situation. And so farmers, what they do is they go back onto the land. They retake their land from the tenants. They kick their tenants off. They bring their families back to help them to you know harvest crops and things like that. And so this leads to a huge range of disputes. Um, and so eviction rose from 5% to nearly 50% by the depression years. So tenant farmers sort of protect their land by erecting fences, picket lines. Okay, this leads to violent clashes. You can see here in a poster in 1929, it calls for you know, peasants to join the, um, or sorry, farmers to join the National Farmers Union, the father of the farmers. Um, you can see here that the small figures being rep uh, repulsed by a union affiliated farmer represents landlords and the village heads the bill being presented by the latter reads tax the union's demands 
Okay, you can read those kind of below there. This is a real focus on protecting the rights of tenant farmers um, who are being evicted you know, off their land. So you can imagine the type of impact that, that is going to have on the agricultural industry and on people in Japan. And so you're going to shift them towards you know, much more radical ideas like militarism. The financial impact as well. So as I spoke to you previously, I spoke to you about these large conglomerates that control a huge amount of the private capital in Japan. After the 1927 Showa financial crisis, these Zaibatsu, these family conglomerates, you know, control even more of the financial um, you know, capital within Japan as they take over these smaller banks that fail during the Showa financial crisis. And so their priority is is um, profit. They prioritize themselves over the people. And so this really, this capitalist way of thinking um, leads to a huge you know, malcontent amongst the vast majority of Japanese. They sell massive amounts of Japanese yen for dollars, and this further depreciates the currency. The currency becomes you know, even more worthless during this period of time. And so when Japan leaves the gold standard finally in December of 1931 in order to stabilize deflation, in order to bring it back, the value of the yen fell, falls by half against the dollar. This is great for the Zaibatsu because what they are holding now is US dollars. And so they then convert it back into yen and so they double their money. A very, very savvy strategy. But this just simply reinforces the view that majority of people had that the capitalists and the Zaibatsu are driven by greed and selfishness. And so that you know further leads to this discontent among the people. You can see here, okay, the um, deflationary period that we have around 1930 and what the impact of that is on GDP growth, okay, national income during that period. You know, we have deflation of, of nearly just beyond negative 5% in 1931. Um, and you can see that we have negative GDP growth of around about negative, you know, 5%. And so this is, you know, a real drastic decrease in Japanese economy during this time. The industrial impact, um, traders obviously going bankrupt when wage cuts and job losses, okay, cuts the buying power of customers. So there's no necessarily need for them to go out and buy things anymore. So Tokyo retail stores, okay, um, the rates of failure, those going bankrupt doubled from 1926 to 1930. Small business owners began joining uh, movements fed up with ineffective policies of both the Seiyukai and the Maseto, these two you know, large political parties, and they refer to them as the running dogs of capitalism. They get grouped together with the Zaibatsu. And you can see here a great quote from the Imperial Middle Class Federated Alliance. The established parties, this Seyukai and Maseto parties, have betrayed us. They've betrayed the people. They're becoming the political lackeys of capitalist cliques, trampling the middle class of commercial industry and agricultural producers. You know, this really shows how there is a, a belief that the political system is no longer serving the interests of the people. Um, and so there is a move to remove it completely. And that is what happened. Um, you can see here from um, historian um, Masanori, okay, according to contemporary newspaper accounts, masses of unemployed laborers without funds for travel trudged along the Tokaido to return to their native villages. Um, that 41.7% of all terminated factory workers um, and 17.4% of all terminated mine workers returned to their farms. Okay, And so these people are going back out into the countryside because they don't have work in the city anymore. So that is just going to lead to further discontent in rural Japan. So you can see here, okay, Gordon kind of sums up okay, the perception of crisis. And, and he's a historian that really regards this as not necessarily a huge financial or economic impact, but it was the idea of, you know, that this is a massive crisis for Japan. Um, and it was, he calls it profound and consequential among the masses, no less than elites. Even before the Depression, the practice of parliamentary rule enjoyed just lukewarm support. It was you know, not necessarily massively supported prior to this. And so when combined with this simultaneous international crisis, the trauma of Depression era provoked new departures abroad and at home. And those new departures abroad are going to be a much more aggressive foreign policy. 
and a shift at home to a more radical ideology. So how do they respond to the Great Depression? Okay, they do it in two phases. Um, and just like in we have in Japanese politics, there is a change of government again. So this leads to problems. Um, the Masato, they're very ineffectual in the first phase. They didn't really push to detach from the gold standard, which was simply worsening this deflationary pressure of prices, you know, really, you know, becoming, you know, worthless. And so that has an impact on wages, it has an impact on revenue. The Seiyukai under Takahashi uh, Korokio, he detached the yen from the gold standard, which helps to boost um, you know, prices in Japan, helping to stabilize them. He also increases government spending through the issuing of bonds. The government is going to go into some debt, but at the same time, they're going to help to, you know, drive economic recovery. And so by 1933, Japan is going to return to pre-depression levels of output, okay? A relatively quick recovery, you might say. And so that has really been the driver behind, okay? Japan wasn't, you know, hugely impacted by the Great Depression. And it, it, it is, okay? They do recover relatively quickly, um, but, you know, the feelings, the views, the beliefs of the time do not recover. And their main belief is that the government has abandoned us. And so that leads to a real shift towards a more authoritarian style government. Politically, that's going to be, you know, the real, where the real change is really going to happen. So the crisis state leads to shift towards more authoritarian style, as I said. We have an increase in protest movement, which is fueled by this anger, frustration, this dissatisfaction, um, the exploitation of the Zaibatsu and the weak government responses, um, as I said, particularly felt in rural areas. Um, and the solution, which was advocated by militarists, okay, was the expansion, which would open up new trade markets, access to more resources, wealth, and improved standards of living. Um, Japan had already expanded during the, and afterwards the Russo-Japanese War by taking control of Korea, making that a formal a colony in 1910 after it became a protectorate in 1905. And so at this time as well, okay, China is on the doorstep and looking relatively weak. So there's a great potential there. This uh, poster, I think, is super interesting because it's really a gruesome kind of way of depicting what Japanese people were thinking at the time. We see here a flyer depicting a, you know, a capitalist. Okay, he is you know, seen to be fat. Okay, this idea that he has been you know, able to have a great quality of life because he's so greedy and selfish drinking the blood of the workers who have no power there and um, um, completely powerless. Okay, is a personal attack on the president of a steel company, both of which are named um, in the characters. You can see that the president is described as a greedy uh, man who has built an expensive new factory and then snatches bread from the workers under the name of recession, all while indulging daily sake and women as well, okay? So this is the view that a lot of Japanese are supportive, okay? That the political parties um, had, you know, abandoned their views and, and, and given in to the Zaibatsu and they were really kind of driving um, the exploitation and the worsening situation that we see during the Great Depression. So socially, we're also going to see a massive change, okay? So 15% of the industrial workforce is going to become unemployed. Um, you know, in the city, this is perhaps about 20% unemployment. Um, this leads to a massive strengthening of movements, okay? And um, the disputes even include women. You can see here a um, reflection of a female speaker at a factory strike in Tokyo. So she says that even if we go back to the countryside, even if we return to our rural communities, our parents and our brothers do not have enough to eat. Knowing this, how can we go back? How can we burden our already poor, starving family back in the rural you know, community um, and they have to take care of us if you know, they don't even have enough? So this leads to a, you know, during the 19, early 1930s, we have street violence. We have a dispute at the Toyo Muslin textile mill and a night march of violence with smashing windows and police brawls. You can see here another cartoon which portrays a government bureaucrat announcing the industrial rationalization, which was imperative. Um, so getting rid of people. But if this causes unemployment, the government will solve this through suitable action. The central figure depicts an oversized manager sitting atop a factory with bloody bodies of workers lying at his feet. You can see that he's sitting on all the cash, that they do not care about the common everyday 
man or woman. And so socially, what we're going to see is that a real rise in prostitution, which is uh, you know, starting to lead to kind of social decline. Um, and what we see is a rise, a huge amount in, in cafe waitresses. And whilst these women were not necessarily prostitutes, they were reflective of this new woman that had emerged during the, the Taisho period, these um, you know, MOBA and MOBA and MOGA men and women who are um, you know, showing this kind of more Western style, very, you know, you know focusing on these new ideas and, and free thinking, um, which really challenged the traditional, you know, conservative Japanese um, views at the time, this, this kotuhai, this national essence. And so the number of waitresses goes from 50,000 in 1929 to 111,000 in 1936. So more than doubles in you know, seven years. And so this really leads to fears amongst um, you know, bureaucrats, elites, um, you know, politicians, because they fear this kind of delinquency and they fear that middle-class women are abandoning their families to simply serve themselves. Um, and, you know, this is a real kind of questioning of the social fabric of Japanese society. We see student protests, um, and, you know, this leads to the dissolution of the Tokyo University New Man Society. We see Communist Party roundups. Okay, the Ministry of Education believed that there was a serious student thought problem, and so this really leads to that special higher police force, um, the Toku, being used to closely monitor and suppress these activities. Um, beginning in 1929, officials launched campaigns to suppress the red lights and the jazz world, these new ideas, this new thinking, this free you know, you know, thinking. Um, they arrested waitresses, they banned students from entering cafes, that, employment, um, that employed women as well. So, um, you know, whilst you know, the cafe waitresses were not prostitutes, they did kind of you know, show this very, um, I suppose, erotic image of, of what these new women were going to, to, you know, to, you know, to do and, and thinking and, and represent. Um, and you can see here um, a quote from the historians. You know, they believe that had Japan not been subject to new outside influences after 1929, it might have continued its earlier pattern of slow gains in parliamentary direction, within the framework of the constitution. And so these new ideas, things like communism, things like nationalism, militarism, um, you know, socialism, these new ideas are really going to you know, change the framework on um, the, the, the system. And so what we're gonna see is the military really starting to lead Japanese politicians and the Zaibatsu and the industrialists into a war okay you can see here this is a very famous cartoon from david lowe we've looked at his things before in uh, the power and authority germany topic you can see that the military man here is chasing butterflies and he's chasing them into china dragging them deeper through the mud into a conflict um and so they you know the you can see that the politicians and the industrialists okay are simply um, and they're unable to do anything to, to stop the, the military. And so this kind of you know, financial and economic crisis leads to a general support of military actions in order to try and solve the problems of the time. And so what we see here is what can be referred to as the descent into the Dark Valley. Um, what we're going to look at in some other tutorials is the foreign policy at the time. Um, but just to give you a short summary is what we have in 1931 is the Kwantung Army, this you know, independent organization um, of, of soldiers, which is in Port Arthur at the time and in, in Northern China, in Manchuria, they stage an incident in order to get a conflict with China. They blow up a portion of the Manchurian railway. Um, and as a result of that, this leads to general support of going in and securing Japanese control over Manchuria. What we see is at the time, the Prime Minister, Inukai uh, Tsuyoshi, um, and the Se Seyukai political party, um, you know, lead, you know, they will have a very weak response, and it leads to the military installing a puppet regime in Manchuria under the last 
Chinese Emperor of Puyi. Um, the unauthorized action of the Kwantung army did not receive did receive huge support from top military leaders in Turkey. They believed that this was the solution to the problems that they needed the military to go in and take action. And the military, they believed that they were doing this in for the people. They believed that they were doing this as a part of Kotohai in order to protect Japanese way of life. Um, and as such, military and police authorities intensified their surveillance and suppression of dissent within Japan. Um, but as I said. This was hugely supported, and so this you know political suppression and, and military kind of um, surveillance was not necessarily required, as because many of them greeted it with you know joy. They believed that you know this was going to be a solution to their problems, um, because they had you know acquired this rich crown jewel of the empire, and so this news you know spread all through newspapers, radio. Kabuki, which is a type of Japanese traditional play, and even in restaurant menus. Um, I was reading in some of the uh, history works. I'm not sure how they celebrated in restaurant menus, maybe looking at particular dishes from Manchuria and celebrating the cuisine um, that had now been brought into the Japanese empire. You'd have to look that up if you want to find out more. Um, the Justice Ministry's 1932 survey of dangerous thought called the incident a divine wind cleansing, you might think, Japan of all of the social issues that had been and economic issues that had been plaguing the country since 1929. And you can see in May of 1932, the Army Ministry concluded that it had brought about a new spirit of solidarity, protected Kotutai, okay, the national essence of Japan, what makes Japanese people Japanese. And in place of you know this social confrontation that had plagued the nation in the late uh, 1920s and into the 1930s, um, this is then simply worsened. So after the military you know is celebrated you know um, and really driving control, what we see is uh, a group of um, young naval officers. There are many, but the majority of them are young naval officers. In May fifteenth of nineteen thirty-two, they assassinate the Prime Minister Inukai Toyoshi. Okay, the group hoped to use uh, violence to bring on martial law and the policies of a national renovation. We'd seen this kind of language before. Remember, if we talked about the Showa Restoration, this idea of rejuvenating Japanese society, of protecting Kotohai this national essence. They simultaneously also attacked the Mitsubishi Bank, this Zaibatsu Bank, the Seukai headquarters, the resident of the Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal, uh, which is um, a stamp which shows the kind of emperor's symbols. So he has a very strong connection to the emperor. Um, and they also attacked six power transformer stations as well. Their, you know, attempted coup fails to spawn a much larger rebellion, but it shows you how politically fragile the system is. And so as a result, they lead to negotiation between the army and leading senior statesman, Prince uh, Seiji. Um, he is a member of the Genro, this leading statesman. Um, and remember that the Genro have the choice of who is going to become the new prime minister in the cabinet. The Seiyukai party, remember, still holds a majority control over the Diet, but remember, the Genro does not need to put the Seiyukai party uh, leader into the role of prime minister. They can choose whoever they like, and they believe that the fundamental clauses of such radical acts of assassinations are political, economic, and other social problems, and thorough, a thorough re renovation is needed to solve these issues. This is from Gordon, um, cited in another source. And so what they do is on May 26, 1932, they put in place Admiral Sato uh, Makoto, who took to control the office of Prime Minister of National Unity. He really starts this new wave of government. And most importantly, he is an admiral. He is a military man, no longer a political party is in power and in control over Japan. And so what we see here is this new cabinet which is formed. Um, of them, only five of the, um, of the 15 ministers were members of a political party. Um, the rest of them were top military men 
okay, and bureaucrats, members of the elite, uh, members of the military, um, leading statesmen, oligarchs. So what we see is now a shift away from party politics, away from the Taisho democracy, towards an authoritarian style of government. And this is only going to intensify in the 1930s as we see more and more power being given to the military. So in saying all of that, I want you to return now back to this central question and to think about not only these two sub-questions about the impact of the Great Depression and, and how this leads to the demise of party politics, but you know, more broadly, have a think about how these steps lead to the development of militarism. And this is really on the beginning. You know, we only see okay, a, a Manchurian railway get destroyed. We're going to see much more radical steps by the military to try and you know, expand much more in the 1930s as they move further into China and they take further control over the political and over the government and running of Japan. So I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. We're going to be coming back next tutorial and focusing more on what is happening in the 1930s, um, focusing on uh, some of the challenges posed and how we see this general drift um, towards militarism as Japan descends into the Dark Valley. So I will see you in the next tutorial.